Lord, I'm tired of living unforgiving. So I'm washing my hands where the healing waters flow. Lord, I'm tired of living. for that day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to your Hallelujah. Name, Hallelujah. 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 God, we praise you. His name, the greatest gift, yes, Lord. He'd ever known. Then came the day who would have dreamed. God would say, You gotta give him to me. It's you and Isaac, or it's me and you. And when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart, but my father's proud, all his altar It's not your Isaac that he wants. He's wanting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I lay my eyes, sit down with a broken heart, but my father's brown. On this altar. Justified it was here. He was. 
a compliment to him. In a broken heart, but my father's proud. of you just love the presence of the Lord. I read the Bible where there was a blind man on the side of the road. The crowd was strong in the Lord all round about him. They must have had their own agenda, but that day, blind Bartimaeus began to cry out to the Lord and said, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped the whole thing just to minister to one man that was blind on the side of the road. You may be here this morning and you may feel like that one blind man on the side of the road. I want you to know this morning he came for you. If you have a need this morning, all you've got to do is lift that need up to the Lord and begin to pray and say, God, I need your help. It's just that simple this morning to simply say, Lord, I need your help. All across the church, if you lift your hands with me, begin to pray, God, just have your way this morning. We want you to do whatever you desire to do. Touch hearts and lives like only you're able to. That you may receive the glory, Lord, this morning. We give you the praise. Hallelujah. Yes, God. me too long. You tried to ruin my life and steal my song. But if I'm not certain, no to on you, you don't have a chance. I'm covered by the precious blood of God's holy man. I'm a blood bought, bona fide child of the key. He's wrapped me in his blood and arms. He let me roll to you. No matter what may come my way, you can't hold me down. Hallelujah, when I'm dancing on solid ground. Oh, I'm glad I'm a blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona fide child. I'm sure you're the blood bought, bona
what you take from me. Lord, if I'm a child of the King, He's wrapped me in His love and love. He made me royalty. And no matter what may come my way, you can't hold me down. I'll be shouting hallelujah. That's an old sign of rest. Yes, Lord, come on. I'm tired of your Satan. You messed with me too long. I tried to ruin my life and still I saw the devil. I'm serving all this on you. Come on. You don't have a chance. I see covered, covered by the precious blood of God's holy name. I'm a blood bought, bought by the child of the King. He's wrapped me in his love. Well, he's made me royalty. This morning, glory to God, glory to God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Come on, don't ever pass an atmosphere like this up. Take advantage of it. Lift your hand, glorify, magnify God this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord, yes. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. My Lord, saturate us this morning. Glory to God, we praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been telling the church around here for a few weeks now, I tell you, the church for many years, the Pentecostal church was thought to be crazy people. Amen. Get to lifting your hands, worshiping God, magnifying God, but they can go paint half their body blue, the other half of their body red. Go stand in a football stadium and jump up and down and scream like a bunch of Banshee Indians. But when you come to the house of God, you get excited about worshiping the Lord. People look at you like you lost your mind. I tell you what I did. I lost it all and I gave everything to the Lord and he renewed me. He strengthened me. He changed my life. Can you say praise the Lord this morning? Is there anybody else that says it's okay? I might be considered crazy, but I am crazy for the Lord. Anybody else says, I'm crazy for the Lord. 
You can think I've lost my mind, but that's all right. I'm just loving all my Jesus. Anybody want to lift your hand right now? Just begin to give him praise. Some of you haven't praised him like you should have all week long. Now's your chance to worship him. Come on, love on him. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Come on, just obey the Lord. Worship him this morning. Take advantage of an opportunity to give God the glory. Go ahead, brother. Sing some more. Magnify the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. We're not in any hurry this morning. Praise God. Dinner will wait on us. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes, God had made Jesus a big old pain they play. To others, he's just a song they sing. Oh, but since I met Jesus, I'm happy to say to me, he's become everything. Oh, and to me, he's become everything. Hallelujah. He's everything that I need. The beginning and the end, he's the life's dearest friend. To me, he's become everything. Oh, and to me, he's become everything. Oh, and he's everything that I need. The beginning and the end, he's the last dearest friend. To me, he's become everything. Well, when I wake up each morning, he's right there by my side. At night, he's my last thorn in my hand. Oh, he's joy for each moment. He's hope that faith brings to me. He's become everything. Oh, and to me, he's become everything. He's everything that I need. The beginning and the end, he's life's dearest friend. To me, he's become everything. To me, he's become everything. You see, before I got saved, it was all about my job, all about my friends, all about my marriage and everything else. All of that has its place, but since I've been saved, He has become everything to me. Come on. Hallelujah. Well, when I wake up each morning, he is right there by my side. At night, he's my last home in my heart. Well, I'm glad he's joy for every moment. Yes, he is. hope that he brings. Oh, to me, he's become everything. Yeah. Oh, and to me, he's become everything. Yes, he has. Oh, he's everything. Hallelujah. The beginning and the end. He's the last nearest man to me. He's become everything. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. How many of you know how to worship the Lord when the music stops? <laughs> Just lift your hand and give God praise this morning. Man, I'm telling you, he deserves it. He does. Praise God. He's everything to me. Look at somebody beside you and tell them that he's everything to you if you mean it. If you don't mean it, don't tell a lie. <laughs> Hallelujah. To me, he is everything. Everything I need. Praise the Lord's name. I'm glad for what I feel in my spirit this morning, aren't you? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, the Lord has really been stirring and moving around here at Gray Street here lately, and I am so thankful for that. I appreciate Brother Gary and Sister Heather and daughter and children and all pouring their heart into everything worshiping with you it's not too often you find people that pour their self into singing a lot of times folks just get up and they're trying to entertain somebody and and they sing like they lost their favorite puppy or something but i tell you what i appreciate people that love the lord amen y'all know what i'm talking about i never shall forget the day me either I, i'll try to forget that particular day <laughs> that that one 
Not the one I got saved. But I tell you what, I'm so glad to see people excited, loving the Lord, and thankful for all that He has done. I appreciate every person participating. Appreciate Sister Wilma and Sister Jackson this morning and Devin and everyone, Sister Tracy this morning, just joining in. And I love every one of you. Most of all, I give God the credit and praise for everything. Not one of us would be where we are today had it not been for the help of the Lord. The Bible tells us a little parable about how that the Lord gave different talents. And I found that over the years that, you know, God gives each and every one of us different talents for different purposes. And you may say, well, how come God didn't make me a singer? How come God, some of you are thankful God didn't make you a preacher, but that's another story. But I tell you, God has a purpose for each and every life that is here this morning. And whether you realize that you never, never preach a sermon behind a uh, pulpit, you may never do that. But I tell you that your life is a walking sermon every day for the people that you love, your friends and your family. That's why it's so important for you to live uprightly and have a good testimony before the Lord. I learned a long time ago in pastor, and you're going to have people that come in and some that really aren't there for the reason of serving God. Some are there for, you know, just to appease the conscience to say, well, you know, I went to church. And then there are other people, just various different reasons. I've seen husbands get dragged to church by their wives <laughs> and vice versa. I've seen kids get drugged to church by their parents. And uh, in the end of things, I've learned one thing. As long as we all come together for the purpose of serving the Lord, God's able to move that's the most important thing to me that I could ever imagine, just to see the presence of the Lord have his way in a service. Boy, I'm really telling you, I'm looking forward to what the Lord is about to do in this service this morning. Been doing some praying, asking God to have his way. Uh, some of you know that we slipped away for a week here recently, and um, uh, we really, really had a lot of sacrifices we had to make to be able to make that trip possible. And even after we got back, I tell you, we just about drained our bank accounts, drained ourselves spiritually, physically, mentally, just about everything. But in the end of it, I'm not, I don't regret it at all. And the reason is, is because during that meeting, I think it was three people that got saved in a little church, not a big church, the three people that gave their heart to the Lord. And uh, on a Sunday morning, this is what the Lord had laid on my heart then. And over the last week, for whatever reason, the Lord continually led me back to preach this message. So I'm going to try to obey the Lord this morning and uh, just preach what the Lord has given us today. So if you turn your Bibles to the book of Hosea, chapter number 1, Hosea, that's between Genesis and Revelation. And if you will, stand to your feet when you find it. Hosea, chapter number 1. We've had a lot of great... Um, feedback from our internet broadcast. Those of you that don't already know this, most of you do. We do internet broadcasts. We do our audio and also our video. And I've had a lot of good feedback from people that have been watching and listening. So anybody that's watching and listening this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to, uh, to you. Uh, there's a sister that I've talked to via the internet. Her name is Sister Sharon Mitchell, I believe is her name. And um, she's been faithfully here lately sending her ties to the church. She's not able to get out and about like some other folks may be able to, but she's been faithful to the church here at Gray Street to uh, watch the services and be in our services by the Internet. So if she's watching this morning, I'm sure she is. I want you to know we love you too. Hosea chapter number 1, verse number 2. If you have it, say praise the Lord. Here's what the Bible said. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. For some of you have never maybe heard this story before. I want to explain something to you before we read too much. What you see here is the righteous prophet Hosea, upon the command of God, go take a harlot for his wife. You see, there was some backsliding of God's people going on. Most of the sin was coming right out of Jezreel. And the Lord was using this great prophet Hosea to send a message to his people. A type or a foreshadow, if you will, example, 
God's love toward his people. During the process of the time that Hosea marries her, she has three children. Not one of the three children belong to Hosea. She eventually, after some time, she turns back completely to her ways of harlotry. She leaves her husband with the three children that are not even his and goes out to seek for things that her husband could not give her. Flagons of wine, flax, and all of these things. So God says in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 4, if you want to skip over there. He said, I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread, my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and mine drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. Make a wall that she shall not find her paths. She shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, but they shall not, she shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better with me than now. Can I say something before we read any farther? If you've turned away from God, backslid on God, I promise you, God continues to deal with you. There will come a time that you will say, man, it was much better serving God. I believe I'll go back to the Father's house. Come on. So then we see how that God begins to deal with this man, this prophet Hosea. To redeem this woman back. She's left the house. She's gone. She's sharing her love with other men. Selling her body. But by the time that he finds her. This woman, this woman Gomer has become a street slave. And has, she has been put up for a purchase price. And now if anyone's going to have her. He has to buy her back. What a strange thing that is. I want you to really get a hold of this. She's going to have to be bought back. Why is that strange? Not only because she's on the auction block of street slavery, but because she already belongs to him in the first place. That's his wife. But he's got to purchase her back so that he has her and can bring her back home to himself. In verse number three, uh, 1, chapter number 3, the Bible said, Then the Lord said unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. Look at verse number two. He said, So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, for an homer of barley and a half homer of barley. I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me, Many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. So will I also be for thee. We you stretch your hand to the Lord right now? Let's pray and ask God to have his way. Father, this morning we appreciate you. We love you, God, for all that you've done. In this place, we pray, God, that you'll minister in a mighty way. God, talk to every soul in this house. We pray, Lord, there be a soul that's lost. God, save them this morning. God, redeem every backslider. We'll be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory for everything that you do in the house of God. And all of God's people can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, I'd like to preach with the help of God this morning, is there a Gomer in the house? Is there a Gomer in the house? I find this morning that a great deal of this generation, as I look around, it seemed to me that many of them don't have any desire whatsoever to serve God. 
Many of them, it's almost as if they don't see any reason why or understand why would I even serve God. Many of them look at you as if, and I've even heard some tell me this personally, why would I go to your church? Why is your church any different? Why is your God any different than my God? Why would I want to serve the God that you serve? So you see, many today don't really understand all about God. They really don't understand why that they would want to serve God in this generation. Could it be this morning that the reason is that they really don't realize everything that God has done for us and all that God has gone through just to make it possible for you and I to have eternal salvation. Can you say amen? Over the years, often I have looked at my children and I felt compelled, man. I felt the need to remind them of what I had to do to put them nice shoes on your feet. Any parents ever felt the need to do that? Hey, when you're going out, you're working yourself to death trying to have nice things and they sit at the dinner table and they look like they got a hole in their chin and they just dropped about, you know, two pounds of macaroni on a $25 shirt and you're going, son, are you kidding me? You have no idea what I went through and I love them to death. I'm just messing with them this morning. But let me tell you this morning, I, I've often explained it that way because they don't really understand until they get to a certain age what it took for dad to accomplish or how many hours that I had to work. Man, we went through the drive through the other day and I looked at Justin and our, our little lunch. I mean, we just went through and got lunch. That's all, you know? And it wound up being like $20 in the drive through of a fast food place with two people to eat lunch. I said, son, you know how many hours I had to work just to buy that lunch? It sound like any of some of you. And of course, he's looking at me with that deer in the headlight look like, dad, I don't really, you know. But you know, the thing is, well, I believe that we're, we're looking at a generation that doesn't understand what the Lord really did to provide for you what he's provided for you. I believe that if you knew what God has done for you, you wouldn't snub your nose up at it. I don't believe you'd come into church, sit through an entire service and leave the same way that you came. But I believe that you'd listen to what God's trying to show you. You'd take advantage of all that God has tried to do in your life. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Could it be that this generation really don't understand the purpose behind God's plan and for their redemption? Maybe they don't understand that mankind because of that fallen humanity in the Garden of Eden, maybe they don't understand that mankind needs a redemptive plan. You see, if we went all the way back to the book of Genesis, we would see that Adam and Eve failed in the Garden of Eden. That close fellowship that they had with God, it was severed because they sinned in the garden. The very tree that God said of all the stuff you can't mess with, they decided they just had to have the fruit off of that one tree. Ain't that just like the flesh nature of mankind? got to have uh, that one thing that they cannot have uh, but it caused them to get kicked out of the garden God used to walk the Bible said in the cool of the day I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like uh, for mankind to walk hand in hand for Adam to walk hand in hand with the Lord uh, of all of creation uh, and to enjoy that bliss uh, and that perfection in the garden uh, but because of that sin that relationship and that fellowship was broken. You see, God had to come up with a plan. God had to do something to bring that fellowship back that was severed in the garden. And I'll tell you this, church, if we look back like our brother mentioned this morning, we understand that the Bible shows us that the law was put in place. God gave his people the law. You know, the law tells us, the Bible shows us that the law was our schoolmaster master that shows us what is wrong and right. Amen. Without the law, we wouldn't know amen that it was wrong to do a lot of the things. That's why the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. And so God laid it down and he said, I know that the rules were broken in the garden but I'm going to show you that this is what it takes to live right. This is what's wrong. That's what's right. You see, but I want us to understand the law could not bring that fellowship back between you and I. Did 
you hear that somebody? In other words, you can never live good enough to be able to retain or regain that fellowship. There was nothing in this world that Adam could do, anybody else, to regain that fellowship except that God had a different plan. I mean, you couldn't live good enough to be able to have his presence in your life. But that was severed. So what was it, preacher? I'll tell you, this morning before that fellowship was ever lost in the garden. I mean, it could be, and he could even be restored. God had to deal with the root of the problem. Anybody know what that is? The root of the problem. It wasn't the fruit on the tree. It necessarily wasn't the serpent that was talking to her. It was the three-letter word with the hiss of a serpent called sin. Can you say amen? You see, so God had to deal with the root of the problem. And what is the remedy for this root problem called sin? I'm glad you asked. The Bible said that in Hebrews 9 and 22. And almost all things are purged with blood. By the law, are purged by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You see, in the Old Testament, them temporary blood sacrifices, they could only do so much. They could only go so far. They could only forgive for a certain season. And then you'd have to offer up another sacrifice. But I'm glad that when the Son of God died on the cross and he cried, it is finished. The Bible tells us it was finished. He died once and for all. Can you say praise the Lord? I want you to know something this morning. Whenever that fellowship was severed between God and man, he had to come up with that redemptive plan. The Bible tells us that God had to make an atonement. Many of us may not understand what the word atonement means, but atonement, if you break it down, it's at one mint. So in other words, Sister Nell, whenever the Lord came up with a plan, Thousands of years later, Brother Nathan, to redeem us back to him in fellowship, he had to bring us back at one with Christ. Come on now. That word meant, it simply means finished. And I already told you when he, lay, when he hung on that cross, he cried, it is finished. So God brought us, those that would accept his sacrifice and, and accept him as their Lord and Savior. He brought you and he brought me back at one with Christ. I don't know if that does anything for you, but to think that we lost that fellowship, that when God sent his son to die, he brought you and he brought me back into that fellowship that could not be restored by the law. It couldn't be restored by temporary sacrifice, but Jesus Christ did it. Can you say praise the Lord? I want you to see something this morning about this story. This, in my opinion, has got to be one of the most beautiful stories in the entire word of God. It was a type or a foreshadow of God's redemptive plan, the story of Gomer and Hosea. That salvation with, that we see in the New Testament, God used Homer and Hosea. Sister Wilma told me before, said, I love that story, Brother Myers. I said, I do too. It's one of my absolute favorites. But do you know this morning, before I preach that out, that is not the only story in the Bible that, that typifies or is a foreshadow of God's redemptive plan to bring us back in fellowship with him. We can look all the way back to the children of Israel. The Bible shows us that they were in, in uh, Egyptian captivity and bondage. And the Bible tells us that they begin to cry out to the Lord. They begin to cry out to Him. You see, they were slaves. You hear what I'm saying? They were slaves. I preach to people all the time that are slaves to self, slaves to addiction, slaves to sin, slaves to all kinds of things. Amen. All you got to do is the same thing the children of Israel did and begin to cry out, God, we need deliverance. God, I need help. Just like they did. Can you say amen? They begin to cry out, Brother Steve. They begin to say, God, deliver us, help us. And the Bible shows us that God came in. The Bible shows us that God drove them out. 
by a strong and mighty hand. They, they had one of the most historical events that most people know about in our day. Some that don't even go to church, they've heard about the Red Sea crossing, how that God brought them over one of the greatest places in their life with the enemy hot on their trail and God used the man of God, Moses, amen, to strike that rod across there in the Red Sea, open wide open. They walked across on dry ground and when they got to the other side, God closed that uh, amen Red Sea up and every one of Pharaoh's army drowned in there and if you read the Bible the Bible said when they got on the other side Miriam picked up a tambourine uh, and she got to playing uh, and the next thing you know they had revival they had church she began to worship God uh, I wonder how many of us uh, when God brings us to the Red Seas of life uh, that we know how to have church we know how to worship God and thank God for the time that he brought us uh, over the Red Sea is anybody else besides me this morning you know that God brought you over some great things Miriam began to worship God began to magnify God but I'll tell you one of my other favorite stories absolute favorite of all time was a story found in the book of Jeremiah about chapter number 18 about Jeremiah where the Bible tells us that the land of the people that God loves so much they began to become apostate they began to stray away from God amen and God began to tell them about his judgment but before God told them all about the judgment God explained to them I want you to know what I'm willing to do I want you to know this morning if you come to the house of God and you think that church is all about rules and regulation you got it all wrong the devil's done lied to you because what I want you to understand is that God loves you so much that just like he did with the children of Israel he told the prophet Jeremiah go down to the the potter's house and when you get there you're going to find a man working on the wheel a potter brother Steve working on the wheel and he said that when he went down there Jeremiah said I looked and he said beheld that that potter was working on the wheel and that clay began to get messed up he said as that clay got messed up he said that he began to reform it if you will and God began to use that and he said now Jeremiah he said am I not able to do the same thing that that potter did am I not able to reshape you am I not able to reform you am I not able to put your life back together honey you may have messed up your life but you're in the right place this morning because God's able to take that clay and make it again another vessel and somebody say man I'm glad this morning that my God specializes in putting lives back together can you say man you may look at me this morning and say preacher I, that all sounds all well and fine and everything and you probably have no idea you know what I've been through and that sounds good coming from somebody that's probably been in church all their life No, ma'am, no, sir. I hadn't always served the Lord. I grew up with a checkered past. I had an evil heart. I was a dirty man. I didn't live like God wanted me to live. Hey man, I've got a real, real checkered past. But I tell you what God did. God loved me enough to save me. I've told this story before, but I want to share it with you again this morning. Some years ago, Sister Reba and Brother Steve, they went to church with us in Mayaka. They probably remember about the time frame. But we lived out in really the middle of nowhere. I told my wife and kids when we were on the way out there to try out for the church, we were almost there. And I told my wife, I I said, have you ever thought about being a foreign missionary? She said, why would you ask that? I said, because I think we're about to be one. Amen. It was in the middle of nowhere. And if you went to Mayaka, it was like you had to go there on purpose. You didn't go there by accident. And so we're on the we're way, way out on the back 40, as they say. And the Highway 70, I think, was the name of the road that ran right there in front of the church. And uh, one night, it was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, my memory served me right. We were laying in the bed sleeping, and we heard a knock on the door. And it sounded like some scratching, sounded like a cat meowing or something. I didn't know what it was. And uh, I, I don't really favor cats anyway. If you do, God bless your soul, but I don't. And I thought especially one waking me up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, morning so I got up out of the bed I was going to find out what in the world was at at my front door scratching on the door I went I opened the front door 
And there stood a young lady. I don't know how old she was. I'm guessing somewhere between the age of 16 and maybe as much as 18 years old, but she was young, probably about 16 years old. She, her hair was all a mess. She had grass all in her hair. Her clothes were all twisted around. She looked like a mess. She was just bawling. Her face was all red. She looked scuffed up, beat up. I don't know what in the world you don't expect to open the door and Micah sit in and find somebody standing like that unless they're trick or treating. Come on. And so I opened up the front door and there she stood and I looked at her. She said, can I come in? I said, oh, oh sure, yeah, sir, sure, come on in. And so she came in and she sat on the couch and she was a squall like a baby and my wife came in there doing what my wife does best. She walked over, sat on the couch, wrapped her arm around, said, baby, what's the matter with you? We could tell something was wrong. Amen, what happened was she was going down the road to Highway 70. Amen, her boyfriend that she was with, they got to arguing. He was driving a big old four-wheel drive pickup truck. He got mad at her and she he reached over her and unlocked and opened up the door and just took his foot and pushed her right out the side of the truck. End over end, over into the ditch. Amen, just about a week before that, I was mowing the grass in that same ditch full of moccasins. Amen, it was just a disgusting mud hole. And so there she sat on our couch and what she said to me disturbed me. And when I began to witness to her brother and I told her how that God could straighten her life out, how that God could fix it all, how that she needed to turn her life to Christ. She got angry with me and looked at me and said, preacher, that's easy for you to say. You don't know where I've been. She said, what you don't understand, I have no friends. My family's disowned me. All through tears, she said all of this. I don't have nobody. She said, my family disowned me. And that man, the one that kicked her out of the truck, he's the only one that act like he ever cared for me. And she said, I love him so much. And I just don't understand, but you don't understand where I've been. You don't understand. It's easy for you to say all that stuff. I looked at her and I said, okay, let me explain something to you first. I said, when I was about 15 years old, I spent a year and four months in a boy's home. I'd been in juvenile detention center. I nearly killed a kid with a fire extinguisher when I was about 16 years old. I'd beaten him in the head with it. I said, I'm telling you, I had the counselors tell me at 15, you'll be in prison by the time you're 18 years old. I said, I've got an extremely checkered past. I said, my parents, I said, I love them to death to this day. I said, but I was with this family for a little while, kicked to the curb and live with that family for for a while, kick to the curb and live with that family for a while. I said, I was expelled from school every time you turn around, suspended, expelled. I said, I got a messed up past. I said, don't tell me. I don't know what I'm talking about. I said, I'm living, walking, breathing, talking proof that God is still able to change your life. And I tell you this morning, I don't know how you came in here. Hey man, I don't know what your life is like, but I can tell you no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, there's still a redeemer. There's still blood. There's, come on, the blood of Jesus Christ is able to wash away every sin stain that you got. I don't care if you're the baddest man in a popka. I don't care if you did meth last night. I don't care if you've been in fornication and adultery. I know somebody that is able and I'd like to ask you this morning, is there a gomer in this house? Because if there is, there's still a redeemer this morning. Can you say him out? Somebody give God praise this morning. All of these stories typify the redemptive plan for fallen man. And this story for Gomer and Hosea has to be one of the most compelling stories that I know of in the Bible. If you go into the book of Hosea, you understand that Israel had allowed themselves to stray away from God. All of the things of God, their relationship they had with God, the commandments of God, just like Adam and Eve did, just like some folks today have. Stray away from the most beautiful thing that was ever given to mankind. Right at the very heart, the center of Israel, you find a place called Jezreel, believed to be the very heart of where all that wickedness was coming out of. So God deals with 
a prophet to show and reveal his hot displeasure with their turning from God. God begins to deal with them through this prophet. And the prophet, he tells him, Hosea, I want you to go and find a woman who has a past. She has a history. She's known to be a woman who sells her love to other men. I don't know about you. Can you imagine being a man of God and having God speak to you in the midnight hour and say, I want you to go marry a woman who's a prostitute. God was going to use that to reveal Himself to His people. If that wasn't good enough, God says, and she's not going to be faithful to you. Imagine getting married to a woman that's a, got a history of being a prostitute and God says she's not even going to be faithful to you. The Bible tells us that before it was over with, she had two boys and one girl. Not one of the children were Hosea's. She had committed adultery on the prophet Hosea. Yet he was still with her. Still trying to love her. She had slipped off trying to get the things that poor old Hosea couldn't give her. How sad was that? Hosea was a man that didn't have a lot of money. He couldn't give her the flax and the flagons of wine. He, wa he wasn't a very rich man. But she was after stuff. And I tell you that what bothers me about this generation is almost like they can't get enough stuff. You got so much stuff, you trip over it on the way to the restroom at night. You got so much stuff, you got to rent storage buildings to put it all in storage. But you got more stuff than you need. And everything in life is about how much stuff I got. But that's what she wanted was stuff. Before it was over with, if that wasn't bad enough, she had three children with him. She leaves Hosea with three kids that ain't even his. My God. The names of those three children meant something. The first two represented God's judgment. The last child, its name, if my memory serves me correct, was Loami. Loami simply meant you are not my people and I am not your God. I don't know about you folks, but if I stop right there, I'd say, God, we're in trouble. I don't know what we would do if God stopped right there. But God didn't stop right there, folks. I read where the Bible begins to show us that God reaches out one good last time. And he says, Hosea, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out there and I want you to find her. When you find her, you buy her back and you bring her back home. Man, I'm telling you what a mess. You're home with three kids that ain't even yours. Uh, your wife is known to be a prostitute. Uh, and God says, now I want you to go out there, find her and buy her back. Can you imagine what it must have been like uh, when old broken Hosea, he leaves. I mean, so let me tell you something, women and men, uh, something about a man, uh, when a man cannot provide uh, and give his wife and family the things they need and want, uh, it is a slap in the face of a man Am I right, men? I can't imagine, Brother Gary, what must have been going through Hosea's mind when he walked down the street. I wonder if she's going to do this to me again. But he walks down the street, Sister Tracy, and he's looking down every alleyway. He's looking at every street corner trying to find his wife. Finally, Sister Barbara, his search turns up a woman that most likely did not at first look just like his wife. This time, she didn't have on that sweet smelling perfume she had when she left the house. Her clothes don't look like they did when she left the first time. I'm gonna tell you something. Can I get sidetracked for a minute? When you backslide, you come back, you ain't gonna look like you did whenever you left. 
spiritually, amen, you spiritually, you're gonna be a mess. <laughs> and God already knew, my God. But, but Hosea goes out there and there she is, Sister Trace on the oxen block, a street slavery, his wife, a woman that probably didn't look like his wife. Her hair a mess, probably hadn't had a bath, probably smelt like body odor, who knows. But there stood the woman he married. And he looked over there. And whenever the purchase price was given, I don't know how it went, but for sake of this message, I'm just gonna speak hypothetically. Got a woman here. She's known all over town to be one of the most unfaithful women there are as the laughs and the mockery through the crowd. Some of the men in the crowd, yeah, I know her. There stands her husband somewhere in the crowd. Anybody give us $5? I'll give you $5. That's about all she's worth as they laugh. How about $20? Somebody else says, oh, that's almost too much. What about $30? Folks, I don't know what the value of money was as far as that they were trying to present. But let me tell you this. What I do know, that man that wasn't good enough to be home, her to be home with, who couldn't give her what she needed, poor old fella, he brought household items to pay the price. He brought stuff that he probably gathered around the house. Maybe if I give him a few of this and a little bit of this barley, and I'll, I'll just gather a few things around the house, and there he stands with a few things in his hand. I'll give you this. I want you to know something, folks. When you and I stood on that auction block of sin, street slavery, I'm glad that when the devil laughed and mocked and stood off to the side and made a joke out of the fact that we messed our life up, we got ourselves in the mess we was in. I'm glad that somewhere in the back of that crowd by there, a nail-scarred hand went up and said, I'll take him, I'll take her, and I'll pay the greatest price there ever was. I'll offer up the blood of the Son of God, my only begotten Son. Let me tell you this morning, what God offered up for you was greater than barley. It was greater than household items. He loved you that much. My God, my God. The bids began to roll in, but there was one in the crowd that was willing to pay the price. Can I slow down and preach this out for a minute? Is there a Gomer in the house? Just one? Just one Gomer. Several years ago, we were pastoring a little house, like a storefront church or house church. I don't remember which one it was. We've always had a desire to do homeless ministry and street preaching and outreach and that kind of thing. One day I was right down here downtown Apopka at a little where the new Wawa is, close to that area. There was a gas station used to be there. It's not there now. And uh, right close to that is another store. And I pulled up to this store and I went to get out of my truck. And of all places, I mean, around here, you might you might think, you know, or downtown Orange Blossom Trail. But there was a woman walking down the street right there by that convenience store. And she said, sir, sir. I don't know. Some of you know what I'm talking about when you just kind of get the feel of what somebody wants. I said, I turned around. I said, how can I help you? She said, is there anything I can do for you? She was a prostitute. The sad part about it, she was actually an attractive woman. Her clothes weren't as messed up as the average person. She looked like somebody at one time had her life together. It hit me so funny. I looked at her and I told her, I said, ma'am, I said, I have been married many, many years happily. 
I said, I don't need anything I don't already have. I said, let me, I said, let me ask you a question though. I mean, I was dying to know. I just, uh, this, and maybe it's a preacher, I don't know. I'm just dying to know. I said, how did you get out of here? How did you end up here? Man, you'd have thought that I opened up the floodgate. Tears began to flow down her face. She started bawling right there on the side of 441. Cars zipping up and down the road right by us. She said, Preacher, she said, some years ago, I hurt my, I got hurt. She said, the doctor began to give me, prescribe me pain medicines. She said, I was in such pain. So I started taking them prescription pain medicines. And she said, so over a period of time, I kept taking them. And the next thing you know, I got addicted to them. And I felt like I couldn't help myself. She was bawling her eyes out. She said, preacher. She said, I had a good house. She said, I live right over here in Errol Estates. My husband was a wealthy man. She said, but whenever the prescriptions run out and the doctors wouldn't give me no more, she said, I started turning to other methods to get it because I felt like I had to have it. She said, the next thing you know, she said, all I can tell you, she said, I lost my husband. She said, I lost my children. I lost my home. I lost everything. And she said, and this is all I've got right here. Amen. I wonder, is there a Gomer in the house this morning? I wonder if there's anybody just like that woman who maybe somehow you've allowed your life to get so messed up. You've allowed junk to happen in your life. And you find yourself this morning, you walk into Grace Street Church of God. You might can put a smile on your face like everything's good and everything's great and life is wonderful. But in the back of your mind and in your heart, you know good and well that everything's a mess. And when you leave here, you're going right back home home to the same old mess you go to sleep at night not knowing whether or not you're going to go home to be with the Lord you don't know whether or not your soul is ready if the Lord should call your name can I tell you this morning this I, this ain't no th- new thing to me this ain't my first rodeo as they say I remember standing on the street corner I ain't going to get in the whole story but I remember standing on the street corner right up here at Hiawassee and Highway 50 with a man by the name of Steve that was backslid on God and he had got messed up been traveling around with carnivals and he sat right there on the corner with a sign that said help please help amen a few days later whenever he finally called me and told me he was ready to go home I remember him telling me this at some point in our conversation he said preacher he said the other night I was laying on the floor of a crack house right over here by John Young Parkway he said as I laid there with people all around the room he said I felt all alone and he said I laid there and I looked right up at the roof And he said, I said, God, if you still love me, if you still love me, send somebody, send an angel to come and show me you still love me. Do you know? I didn't understand it then. But the day, I'm not going the whole story, it was a very strange way that God brought it all together. I was running out of gas and I happened to run into a guy that would live three hours or two and a half, three hours away that I knew from years ago and somehow he's traveled the United States and wound right back up at Highway 50. I don't believe it was coincidence. But when I got out of the pickup truck and I began to walk towards him, his face lit up like he was just shocked and he began to walk backwards and I remember him looking at me saying, I know you. I know you. He said, you're a, you're, you're, you're a holiness preacher. That's what he said. I said, yes, Steve. And I said, what in the world are you doing out here? Do you understand, folks, that God loved that man so much? Just another modern day Gomer. So much that his church, two and a half, three hours away from here, was in revival and they were praying, God bring Steve back home. Guess what? Before the revival was over with, some of you know the story, so I'm not going to retell it. If you want to know it later, I'll tell you. It's one of the most powerful stories you ever heard. 
But God was so good that that church in revival praying, God bring Steve home. Hadn't seen him in who knows how long. Just a few days later, my wife and I, when he called and he began to cry over the phone, I got through, I got through, we picked him up. And from right down here near Hiawassee and, and 50, I picked him up in our Astro van. And from there to most of the way, all the way to Arcadia, Florida, he puked. He threw up in my floor. We prayed. He got delivered, cast out devils at him. He got saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost going 70 miles an hour down the road in an Astro van. I'm going to tell you, by the time we got to that church, Sister Nell, we pulled up in the parking lot, come riding up in that parking lot. I called called somebody that I knew that was a part of that church. I didn't know there was a revival. I didn't know they'd been praying for him. All I knew is I was running out of gas one day and seen him up on the side of the road. And you know what God did? God allowed me to get in touch with one of the people from the church. And when we come pulling up in the grass of the parking lot, they had a line right out front of the church. i never forget it by the grace of God. They had people on the left side, people on the right side of the foyer leading out of the front of the church. And Brother Rufus Caraway daughter was singing coming home on the piano on the inside of the church and whenever that boy got out of the car there was a whole church full of people standing out in the parking lot on both sides crying and bawling their eyes out weeping and praying thanking God that Steve came home I tell you what Steve did Steve walked up to the front every single person standing on the left everybody on the right began to hug Steve began to thank Steve for coming home began to thank God and you know what Steve did straight to the altar. Maybe a year or two later, I wouldn't plan on telling this much, but it, it must be some reason. About a year or two later, Steve was still serving God. He was going to the jails, preaching in the jails down there where that he lived. He was doing homeless ministry and he would get a little paycheck. We're talking about somebody that was homeless on drugs he sent me a message and said brother Myers I got a truck I was thinking a jalopy something falling apart I got the picture it was a brand new pickup truck it looked like something that was almost showroom condition beautiful truck I'm like my word son that is awesome we're talking about somebody holding a sign help please help now I got a nice truck I thought, praise God. He said, I'm working a job. And he said, the other day, he said, I, I, I don't have a lot of money now, Brother Myers. I just barely get enough money to pay my bills and my room and board and all that kind of stuff. He said, but, but, I, but the Lord dealt with my heart. He said, I want to start sending some money to your homeless ministry. And every week, we'd get a little check, Sister Tracy, from a man that one day we seen him on the side of the road with a sign saying, help, please help. I'm not new to this, folks. I've seen how God can take a gomer and bring them back home. I've seen how God can take a man's life and turn it all around. And if that wasn't the icing on the cake or the cherry on the milkshake, I'll tell you what God did. Amen. I got to talking with him one day and I said, Steve, every Saturday we would go out into the woods and we'd find homeless people in homeless camps. I said, Steve, how'd you like to go with me on a Sunday afternoon between church services and see and talk to homeless people? And he had started preaching. I said, and you can come preach for me. He said, Brother Myers, I would love that. Boy, I'm going to tell you folks something. Some of the dead head, oh, Lord forgive me, I don't mean no disrespect. Some of these dead people that don't worship God, you would just about be ashamed of yourself ever got beside Steve in a church service. That man would out-worship a whole congregation of people. I'm telling you, that man knew where God brought him from. He would sit on the front row of the church and he would jump up and down. Whoa, hallelujah, praise God. And everybody walking in was like, what in the world? But you see, they didn't know where Steve came from. You hear me? They didn't know where Steve came from. There's people sitting around you this morning that don't know where you came from. Don't know what things you've done in your past. Don't know where you've been. They don't have to know. You know why? Because my God loves you so much that he sent me here to preach to you this morning. Is there a gomer in the house? Is there just somebody this morning that's able to say, you know what, preacher? I've got some things in my life this morning that I've allowed to get a hold of me. And instead of me having a hold of it, 
It's now got a hold of me. Just one gomer in the house. Did you say that no one seems to care anymore about me? Only time people care about me, preachers, whenever they can get something from me. Maybe you're just like Comer. Maybe you live remembered what you walked away from this morning. Maybe you come here this morning, you know what you walked away from. You don't need a whole church full of people reminding you where you used to be. You know what you walked away from. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, if I could get out, I would. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Brother Gary, would you come this morning and play something for me this morning? You and your family. Maybe you don't know where to start. Maybe you're like many of us who got family, and boy, they are just absolutely messed up in sin. Huh? Not where they need to be. It breaks your heart when you look at them. You know that they're not where they need to be. It breaks your heart to think that if the rapture were to take place, they wouldn't go. It breaks your heart to think that if they were to die, that you may have to be the one standing on the side of their casket while you put flowers on that casket, knowing good and well that they're not going to go on to be with the Lord. Maybe that's you this morning. You say, well, Pastor Myers, I just don't know. I really don't know what else to do. I'm going to give you some advice. You ready? If you have to take baby steps, you don't have to understand all this. You don't have to understand God's redemptive plan completely. There's a lot of things that God will begin to show you and reveal to you, but I promise you this. Coming from somebody that's walked this road. Mel, I've been there. There's things in my past that I'm so ashamed of, I don't even like telling it. Decisions, Sister Barbara, I wish I could go back and change, and I can't. I don't have to. Because when I brought all of those things to the Lord, and I laid them at His feet, He was good enough. The Bible said while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Will you stand this morning? deals with your heart. I want you to obey the Lord this morning. Put your mind on the Lord this morning. You just say this morning, God, I need you. I need your help this morning. heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning I really don't know what you came in here battling with go ahead brother but you do maybe you came this morning your mind's been tossed to and fro torn about a lot of things maybe you come in this morning you'd like to believe that you're free but in truth you're kind of like Gomer You come home for a little while. You try to do the right thing for a little while. But before long, you find yourself going back out. Doing the same things again. If you're here this morning and you're tired of going through that cycle of defeat. I want you to step out right now. As a step of faith to show God I'm serious. I'm ready to make some things right in my life, God. I'm not going to turn back. With your help, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. There's some already praying. I wonder if anybody else would be willing. Don't let your pride keep you from what God's will will do for you. Would you come right now and find yourself a place and pray? Come right now. Put all of those sins under the blood of Jesus Christ. 
come right now, kneel down in an altar and say, God, I'm ready to make some things right. I know I've been wrong. I've allowed bitterness to get a hold of me, preacher. I've allowed hatred. I've allowed a lot of things to destroy my faith in God. I've allowed lust. I've allowed perversion. I've allowed whatever it is you've allowed. Addiction. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're not here to embarrass anybody. We're here to love you right to the foot of the cross. I wonder, would you come right now? Make the best, biggest decision you've ever made in your life and just step out right now and come to the front to pray. I'm not asking you to come pray to me. I don't want you to do that at all. I'm asking you to step out and pray for the Lord's help. Come on right now. Saints of God, I want you to help me pray for these that are praying. Everyone that will, come and join us in this altar this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, I'm, I, I feel like I'm pretty well where I need to be in the Lord. But I've got some family that aren't where they need to be. And I want to come and pray for them this morning. If that's you, I want you to come right now. I want you to get down the altar and begin to ask the Lord to touch their heart and their mind. Come on now. Put it under the blood. Put it under the blood. Put it under the blood. God said to Jose, I want you to go find her. Do you know this morning the Lord has come to Grace Street Church of God looking for Gomer. He's come to this church this morning looking for that person, that woman, that brother, that man, whoever that's in trouble. You're in trouble this morning and if you keep going down the road that you're on, You're going to allow addiction and other things to enslave you to the point that you have no desire to even serve the Lord anymore. I want you to know if God was good enough to do it in the past, He's good enough to do it again. No price was too high for the Lord to pay. Matthew 26 and 28 he said for this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins that's why the Bible said in the very famous if you want to put it that way verse John 3 16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son do you know he did that for you It's not his desire that you should perish. It's not your desire that you fall by the wayside, can't serve God anymore, don't want to love him like you used to. Come on, prayer warriors. Come on, prayer warriors. Find a place in the altar and begin to pray for those that God's laid on your heart to pray for. Begin to believe God to turn things around. Maybe there's some things in your life going on right now that nobody else knows about but you and God. You're carrying a burden. You've brought a burden into this church service this morning. And you're hurting. Lord, I just pray right now, God, touch our friends and our families. Save our lost loved ones. God, deal with their heart before it's too late. God, rescue them from a life of running from God many of you you have family that know what's right Lord this morning I pray God use us use us God however you see fit to draw others to you our own family and friends our own our own use us to reach out to those we don't even know Let our life become a burning ember, a burning fire. Oh, come on now. Lord, this morning, I pray that you'll save me, deliver me. We can't change the decisions of yesterday. We can make decisions right now on this altar that can change the rest of our life. 
When the devil tells you, oh, you can't do it, you won't stick with it. You get aggravated enough with the devil just to show him he's wrong. Devil, you don't know the God I know, how he's able to help, heal, deliver. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it by the help of my God. Lord, I'm praying that you'll help me deliver, strengthen, heal. God, that you'll help my family members. Some of you, you invited some of your very close loved ones this morning and they chose not to be with you in the house of God. Don't you give up on them. Don't you quit praying for them. They need your prayer. They need somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Somebody who won't turn around. Everything you have need of, I promise you, you can find it in the altar. Oh, yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord. Than anything Come on. This world affords today. To be the king of the past. Seems I can't hardly go, but still I see victory. And at times I'm walking by faith, I can't see what lies before me, but still I see victory. 